What's going on, everybody? Another episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. And for all I know, you might have even clipped out uh, what we just did. No, there. Didn't. no, you didn't. You didn't do that. Okay. No. Well, then, then you go, don't get to know how we got here. But on today's episode, we're going to talk about martial arts and pop culture throughout the '80s and the impact of. Really, we can talk about how each impacted the other. And if you are watching, which you should be, because we record these in video rather than listening, you'll notice there's a third person. You're not hallucinating. Bill <laughs> Leaf's back on the show. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. In your school. Welcome. Thanks for being here in your own space. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting us Thanks be for in letting your us be in your space. Yeah. Uh, you know, shortly after the recording here, uh, and actually, I think we're probably going to cut this in. We're going to go grab some footage of yeah. the manhole cover, which really was the, the spark. I mean, was that the first time you and I talked was when you emailed me about that? It was probably the first time we talked more than a quick email setting up an interview with Mr. Durkin, but yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Right. So we, Andrew and I have been thinking about martial arts, pop culture, Ninja Turtles, how all of this relates because it really, there, there's so much overlap and cross inspiration. It's hard to separate. Can you imagine 1980s cartoons without martial arts in them, without fighting, without combat? I mean, it existed. What are, you're left with what? My Little Pony? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that. I mean, because at first I was thinking. Maybe well, Smurfs? Yeah, Care Smurfs. Bears. Care Bears. Yeah. They follow their hearts a lot. That's a whole other episode. We could talk about the martial implications of the Care Bear Stare on another show. But you're right. Like even even shows that weren't martial arts, like you know, obviously we're talking like Ninja Turtles, like yeah. something that wasn't quote martial arts, like He Man and She Ra. Like they still had fighting and there's stuff. Still, in them, you know? Yeah, there's still a lot of fighting in there. Now we need to kind of figure out the audience. They've been paying attention for a while. They've got a good idea of where we are on Ninja Turtles and movies and things like that, but less so you. So, you know, what did you grow up with? Well, I definitely grew up with all that. I mean, Ninja Turtles, uh, Karate Kid, mm -hmm. more through my teens, um, X-Men. Mm -hmm. That was huge. Mm -hmm. That was huge. Uh, I believe there was a Spider-Man cartoon in the 90s. Oh, sure. yep. Correct? yep, yep, there was. There yeah. was one in the... 80s as well. Okay. Well, Spider-Man is ageless. But Batman, Superman, Justice League, all that stuff yeah. kind of pops into mind right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me it was also G.I. Joe. I was big into G.I. Joe. But not all G.I. Joe. I liked all the G.I. Joe that had martial arts experience. So obviously everybody knows Snake Eyes, right? He was the, and Storm Shadow came along afterwards. They were the two big ones, but there were a lot. Um, and I will, I'll, I remember I was really excited when I found out that Doc, who the, you know, went around to doing medicine stuff. He was a pacifist. He didn't like to fight, but he trained in Aikido. And that, and I was like, whoa, that's so amazing. Yeah. So I had to go out and find the Doc action figure. Because he did martial arts, just like me as a kid. Just like, I wanted that. Or Jinx, or you know, all of the other ones. That if, it, if it said they trained in martial arts, I wanted to get that action figure. And you used a phrase that I think is so critically important. And we've talked about this. We've already talked about this today in other contexts. Just like me. Mm. Right? That's one of the things that I think is so important to youth, specifically. But all of us, we want to feel relevant and when we see somebody on screen whether it's professional sport or a movie or tv whether it's live action or animated if they're doing something that we can do or are trying to do or see ourselves on the path to doing it justifies what we're doing it gives us social proof in a sense it gives us a, a path forward we can look at these people and say one day i'll be like them one day, you know, maybe I can do what they're doing, or I'm going to try to do what they're doing. And if you don't believe me, take a look at professional sports. If you have a child in the house who is playing basketball, soccer, football, hockey, whatever, they probably have a favorite pro athlete, and they probably look at that person 
and they see that person as something to aspire to. Was that at all your experience growing up? Did you look at Ninja Turtles, et cetera, and say, I want to keep going. I want to be green and eat pizza. <laughs> I mean, my, my, meta, my metaphor is breaking down a little bit. <laughs> I mean, what about the pizza part? You know, I, I, it's so, it's so, I'm trying to put my, myself in the mindset of an eight year old. Yeah. I'm sure subconsciously, maybe, I mean, me and my brother, we ran around the house pretending to be our favorite Ninja Turtle. But I don't know if we had Who that. Who was? Um, I, I personally wanted to be Michelangelo, but I think I was more of a Donatello or Leonardo, just knowing myself. My brother was for sure Raphael. I, Raphael. Yeah, for sure. That was me. I wanted to be Raphael. Mm -hmm. I was definitely Donatello. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody out there knew me back then? <clears throat> you're not. You know. It's good to know. One, I so. competed with a bow, and I was a nerd. Did you wear a lot of purple? No, it wasn't really acceptable for boys to wear purple mm -hmm. in the eighties. Which, I mean, it seems so silly to say now, but and and if you even go back further when the Ninja Turtles were created, which, you know, we haven't mentioned that, we've mentioned that we're in, in your, your dojo here in Dover, New Hampshire, but the Ninja Turtles were created in Dover. Um, you know, Peter Eastman and Kevin Laird created the comic book when they lived here, and they didn't have colors. There was no, right. Donatello wasn't red. purple, they were all red. red. Yep, and in fact, Raphael, mm -hmm. in the first issue, didn't fight with Sai, he fought with Tonfa. Which was interesting. He later transitioned to Psy, and you know they didn't have, uh, you know, Michelangelo didn't have an M on his belt buckle, like, and they were kind of gritty and mean, and they were not. It was not a cartoon for kids. It, it, would, it was not. Would not have been. It was more what we would call today a graphic novel rather than a comic book. Gritty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I re I related to Raphael when the when the, the you know, when the TV show came out, the cartoon came out, because I definitely got exp exposure to the cartoon first, and then started collecting the comics. Um, but yeah, Raphael was, was me, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I liked Psy. In fact, I even had the Raphael learn how to karate comic book, where he taught stances in Japanese. And I trained in a traditional Gojuru school where stances were taught that's zenku tudachi that's the japanese word for a front stance and mm. in the comic book is Raphael showing you how to do zenku tudachi and it says in japanese zenku tudachi and i was like this is really cool like again this is something mm. that i do and i was able to relate to it a lot someone mm. did their homework i was very impressed i was very impressed and, and that's something that always struck me because i assumed you know i i when I learned about the, the animated show, right? I, I, I remember vividly discovering that one day. And then I found out that they were based on comic books. As I got older, I remember thinking, these guys must train. And then I learned only in the last few years, they didn't. Mm. To put in so much authentic detail, rather than just having them randomly using swords, kind of impressive. Right? Like you don't generally see for a kid's cartoon that much authenticity. I mean, I think I think I know you well enough to say that you've got a bit of nerd in you, right? Like sure, you, sure. you would do that if you were gonna create something, you'd yeah. want it to be authentic. I know that about mm -hmm. you, Andrew. I'm certainly the same way. I don't know how many of you in the audience are like that. But if I was going to create something quickly, which I imagine the transition from the comic books to the cartoons were it was fast intentionally because of financial reasons you know i might have dropped some things i might have said all right what's you know what's faster to draw sigh or this stick mm -hmm. or this other pointy thing mm -hmm. right you know i'm probably a producer at whatever production house and not really caring because if it's on tv kids will watch it but there was still so much in there. And if you look at Master Splinter, right, that's pretty darn authentic too. So I, there, there's so much of that flow of real martial arts into pop culture. And we see that, you know, what are some of the other places that we see that direction? You know, think about it in terms of TV and movies. 
in regards to the martial arts? Yeah, the martial arts influencing in an authentic way. I mean, Karate Kid is like top of the list. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. And and again, if you trained martial arts in that time, how could you not watch that movie and say, that's me? Whether you did Go Jiru or not. And and I only, it, they've never said in the movie officially that it was Go Jiru, but the instructor's name was Miyaki. And then the third movie, he does Seiyun Chin, which is a Go Jiru Kata. So I'm just saying I think he, I think it was Gojiru. But I did I did Gojiru and I definitely made the connection to his, you know, his instructor's name is Miyagi and Chojin Miyagi is the founder of the style that I do. Like it was hard to not feel that connection and that kinship with Daniel because of that movie. For sure. For for me it was the oh, here's someone else that gets picked on and also does karate and eventually overcomes. And they did a really good job with that movie in not just showing that part of it, like overcoming challenging, overcoming challenges, perfecting himself, but also the the student teacher relationship between Daniel Miyagi and teaching yeah. life values of the martial arts. I think for a lot of people, that was the introduction to what the martial arts can do yeah. besides just punching and kicking. In such a great introduction, right? Any of us who've been training a while know that most people come for punching and kicking and they stay for other reasons. Absolutely. And that was, as you said, a good introduction to those other reasons. What other shows? What other shows did we see it move in that direction? So I, I don't know how much this would have influenced stuff. And, and it wasn't the show that I watched very much, but the Mighty Marvel from Power Rangers have been around forever. I mean, they're still, I mean, the actors have, have changed, but I'm pretty sure the show still exists, uh, like making new movies and things. Um, but when I was a kid, I remember that existed. I didn't get into it personally, but I know a lot of people did. Yeah, it was, that was post eighties, right? Cause that's, I, I think it was 92, 93 Could, yeah. when that rolled out. And that's why I didn't watch it. Cause it, I, I tried, you know, I had friends that were talking about it and it just, it felt a little cheesy, a little young yeah. for me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in the same, was in the same boat. I thought. I was definitely the age bracket, me and my brother, that they went for. And it was cheesy, but we still loved it. Right. And, and um, I, I, I've said on this show many times, Karate Kid is not a good movie, but it is a great movie. Hmm. Right? Just because it, it's, I mean, it, it, things can be bigger than the sum of their parts if you find value in it. What was it about Power Rangers that made you say, this is something that I love? probably the complete opposite of uh, just coming to mind of Karate Kid. I mean, it was just punch and kick and explosions. I'm sure there was some life lessons they put in there, mm. but I was too young at the time to, to catch them. I mean, it was the 90s. I'm sure they put a little after school special in there at some I'm point sure. too. Yeah. Um, but no, it was just flashy and there was cool stuff happening. It was giant monsters and they all transformed. I mean, what else could you want? No, when you're eight years old, I mean, it's kind of all you need. Yeah, pretty great. Yeah, and, and I was older when it came out. I would have been in high school when they came out. And all I remember was it was, for me, it was too fantastical, which is silly because, like, I like car, you know, Ninja Turtles aren't fantastical, right? So that's a little weird. But I do remember having a crush on the Pink Ranger. I do remember that. Let's talk about the other direction. It's pretty obvious if you look at pop culture in the 80s, you can see the martial arts influence. It was for for a lot of people, you know, it was the greatest era of martial arts films, mm -hmm. right? They were being turned out pretty quickly. Uh, you had a lot of franchises that had a lot of sequels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of them continued to get worse. I'm not going to say got worse. They continued to get worse because most of the first iterations weren't very good. But there again, we see a lot of movies that we look at through the lens today and say, this is not a good movie. The acting is bad. The writing is bad. The martial arts isn't even very good, but it was on screen. The we got to watch it. The first one that comes to me was the American Ninja movies mm. with Michael Dudikoff. Um, they made like six or seven of them, and the actor ended up changing. But I remember like, oh, like, again, he's, he's a ninja. Like, right. I'm a ninja. 
at least I thought of myself as you a ninja. You wanted to be a ninja. You know, I yeah. wanted to be a ninja. We all wanted to and be And so, ninjas. you know, absolutely. Like, they were there. And, and something that we looked up, that I looked up to, not up to, that's not, I didn't look up to them, but I saw it as a piece of me, part of me. Yeah, part of something that was important to you mm. was represented on screen. Right? And if you're if you're a car person or a horse person or whatever, right, you might go watch a similar, you might watch a movie that revolves around that theme for a similar reason. Yeah. For me, it's all the Van Damme movies. I watched them. I'll still watch them. Yep. They're yep. still terrible, but favorite? they're still fun. Mm. What's your favorite Van Damme movie? <sighs> Probably Kickboxer. Okay. It's a classic. Because... I still hurt when I think about him kicking the tree. <laughs> My shin still hurts when I think about that. One of Mr. Durkin's students used to do that outside, you know, against an oak tree. This man is top, top martial arts. He doesn't do it anymore. He's reaching seven. His legs are broken. But <laughs> we, were sitting in the, we were sitting in the dojo one day, and um, one, of the, one of the fathers was just sitting there, and we were just chatting, and then... This is, this is Len Burroughs, Mr. Dirk's most senior student, walks in, and they look at each other, and the, the father goes, Len? And Chris? I remember you. You were my brother's, you were my neighbor. You were my brother's friend. You used to sit, stand outside the house and just smash this tree with your shin all day. I'm like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. For me, my Van Damme movie would be Bloodsport, because I liked the, the, I liked seeing the different martial arts. Yeah. The competition at the end where there was the guy running running around the ground like a monkey, like that yeah. that sort of stuff I really enjoyed. Um, and so that was mine. Have you seen the movie JCVD? Short for Jean-Claude Van Damme. It's one, I don't remember when it came, maybe 10 years or so. It's one of my favorite hits, and there's very little martial really? arts in it. Okay. It's basically Jean-Claude Van Damme, the actor, a day in his life that goes wrong. Is going through all his life. And it's a challenge. movie, not a TV show. No, it's a movie. Okay. Uh, it's his. It's his. His life is just having the challenges that happens. Interesting. And he just kind of stumbles into a situation where his martial artists may his martial artists may have to be used, and there's a very very good monologue in it about his feeling about the martial arts mm -hmm. and what it means to him. Interesting. I'll have to check his that life out. Challenge. I would. You can see it. I think it's free on YouTube. At least the. Um, the, the French version of it, I think, is free on YouTube. Okay. That's Definitely check it out. Very, very good movie. Interesting. That's, those are words I'm not, I don't think I've ever heard mm. connected. Yeah. It's a very good Van Damme movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because I think that nowadays there's, I hate them saying, sometimes there's too much fighting in martial art movies. There's not enough subtlety with it. Mm. It's just nonstop action. I need some I, plot. I need a reason right. to care about the outcome of the fight. And it gets redundant at a certain point. And this movie doesn't have all that info. When it has it, it's, it hits the right spot. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of humor, too. Mm. A lot of Jean-Claude Van Damme humor from the man himself. That's funny. And then the other one that, obviously, I can't have an episode like this not mention, Best of the Best, which was a great martial arts movie. It's so bad. It it's was, so bad. It's so good. It's so Don't bad. Think it, seen it. You're missing out. No. Okay. Don't. <laughs> As a kid... Did you ever, ever drive by a, a really bad car accident your and your mother don't. said, put your head down, mm -hmm. don't look, and you wanted to look, but you knew if you looked, you'd regret it? That's best. But then you looked and you saw some really cool things. No. No, you didn't. You saw you saw terror. Anyway. Horror. horror. That's the word. <laughs> so maybe a movie I'll put on in the back and <clears throat> listen to it first and then see if I want to commit. This is a long-standing joke on the show. I don't okay. know if you've caught yeah. these episodes, I but I've heard of um, few references. Yeah, I'm convinced it's a conspiracy. I don't think anyone actually thinks it's a good show. I yeah. think they just Dennis like Mark. messing with me. Dennis Mark and I love it. Yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah. Not a... Seagal. I think we need to talk about Seagal as kind of an interesting bounce in and out, right? Martial arts into pop culture and mm -hmm. then back out because... I would say Seagal was the first time most of us saw on film martial arts that made us go, I think that would work, mm. right? I wasn't watching Van Damme movies saying, I'm going to do that, right? It was all 
fairly simple movement mm -hmm. and obviously chore choreographed. It was fun. We enjoyed it, right? You could say the same thing about most of what's in Karate Kid and most of the other movies. It was either really fantasy driven or obviously choreographed. But Seagal, oh, that looks like that would work. I yeah. think that's kind of, I didn't do Aikido, but we did enough jujitsu that it's like, that kind of looks like what we were doing in class last week. For me, I found watching Seagal movies interesting because I, you know, we did the Aikido stuff, you know, and Japanese jujitsu, stand up jujitsu stuff. But Steven Seagal was a martial artist, but he didn't punch and kick. And that was very bizarre to me. Uh, and because of that, I enjoyed watching it because it's like, wow, this is a different thing uh, that I'm not used to. Uh, and I really enjoyed that because of it. I haven't seen enough Seagal movies to even remember anything besides a uh, standing joke between me and my friends as young adults of going up behind someone, just snapping the neck and going, Steven Seagal. Uh, <laughs> and walking away. So I really can't come beyond that. We might have turned a few. I don't think I would have ever stopped making that joke. That's hysterical. That's we might have made a few quick range bunk guys into just Steven Seagalling someone, but that's all I can really add to that. And then I think the other one that almost fits in that category is Kempo and the Perfect Weapon with Jeff Speakman. Mm, Jeff Speakman, for sure. Because anybody who was unfamiliar with Kempo and watched that movie, you went, oh, there's something here. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever see The Perfect Weapon with Jeff Speakman? No. Pro I would say, because it's 89, right? 89, 90, That 91? sounds right. Yep. Okay. I would say, of that crop of 80, 80s movies, probably the best quality martial arts on film. There might be something I, I haven't seen. Yeah, no, but I, of the movies that I've seen, I yeah. think that's, that's it. I, I, I wonder what those of you out there think. Let us know. But if you got to watch one, that's the one. Okay. I would agree. I would watch a perfect. I would. I would watch a perfect weapon over best of the best. I would. Do you guys have a favorite movie that came out of Hong Kong cinema, cinema at that time? I don't know that I watched any. Okay. I, I don't. I don't. Because here, here's the challenge. If you know, <clears throat> one of the things that we that I think is really important, and you're, you're teeing this up well, so thank you, is that to go back and watch those movies now, it can be hard. it's really tough because we're, we're decades later, what we expect in movies has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And my best example for this is, is actually not a martial arts movie, though it's come up on the show quite a few times in the early days, is The Princess Bride. Mm. I was in my mid-20s when I watched The Princess Bride for the first time. And I'd heard people talk about it, rave about it for years. And then I watched it and I went, this is terrible. What's the big deal? Because I watched it as a 25-year-old. Mm. And then probably 10 years later, I watched it again. And I said, you know what? I need to try to watch this as if I'm 11. Mm. And it was so much more enjoyable. That makes sense. That makes and sense. I think you've got to do the same thing with 80s martial arts, films, cartoons, TV shows, etc. You have to try to put yourself into that time. Because if, assuming you consider those things art, art needs to be considered in the time it was created. Mm -hmm. Most art is not timeless. Yeah, sure. You look at an old Bruce Lee movie and it's a slower pace. Yeah. First of all, Princess Bride, great movie. We saw the anniversary edition in theater, so. Nice. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you look at Bruce Lee, some of his first movies, great movies. You look at it compared to the base of a movie now, and you got to really like just settle down and like let it let it breathe. You almost want to yeah. put it on like one and a quarter speed during the fight scenes. Mm. Well, allegedly, the film was they had to slow down the film because they were moving so fast to begin with. Yeah, and 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 I would I would agree completely. And I don't even think it's just the fight scenes. I think it's the pace of the movie itself yeah. it was very different back then, for sure. There were fewer things vying for your attention. Mm -hmm. Now. So many things are competing for our attention that things have been sped up because we're used to that immediate release of dopamine, yep. serotonin, whatever, yeah. whatever, the, one of the two, both of them, I don't I, I forget which is released at what points. And we're addicted to it. You know, phones, TV, everything is faster. Music is faster. Everything is faster. Trying to keep us riled up. 
Another reason we need the martial arts. Another reason. Agreed. Let's slow ourselves down. Great segue. Anyway, that was good. Thank you. And that's all a big part of why so many of us deal with anxiety, mm -hmm. because our brains have been hijacked. Yeah, it's finding balance. So if we all gave up all pop culture made after like 1995, maybe 98, we could get rid of most anxiety in the world. Well, I don't know. If we also get rid of phones. Yeah. Get rid of phones and modern entertainment. And, and, we're done. and right now we're, we're about going to finish up this episode and then go to the manhole cover. We're going to go to the manhole which, cover. I want to explain a little bit more for people that might may have jumped in and heard this for the first time. So mentioned we're in Dover, New Hampshire. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were created here in Dover, as we already mentioned. And a group of people put a GoFundMe out a couple of years ago. Is that right? Two, right. two years ago? I think it's been ongoing for a while, but they finally got it moving. Um, a, a couple of years ago to commission the town of Dover to install a manhole cover in the town that is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle themed, which is pretty cool. Yes. Now, Original if, artwork from the creator. Yeah. Yeah. If you were never a fan of the show, you might not get the connection. The turtles lived in the sewers under New York City. Yeah. Hence manhole cover. So we're talking about getting rid of phones and stuff. So why don't we uh, pack up and go to the manhole cover and record stuff on our phones? Yes, use our phone to take a picture. Bill, thanks for letting us hang out with you. My pleasure. Crash your space. Coming on camera. I talk to you every day. Thanks. Yeah. Th thanks for driving down. Yeah, absolutely. To you out there, thank you. Genuinely, thank you. Thanks for spending some time with us. Remember, if you want to support Whistlekick, go to whistlekick.com, grab something using the code PODCAST15, join the Patreon if you've got a school, Whistlekick Alliance. And if you've got ideas for guests or topics, let us know. Andrew at whistlekick.com, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. What's your website? Uh, it's leithkarate.com. Leithkarate.com. And what episode number? Oh, gosh. We've had... Monday's episode is episode 924 as of recording this. I don't remember everyone's episode number. Come on. No, you're usually better than I am. I got I got nothing. I'm, I'm guessing in the 900 teens, I'm guessing was your episode number. Do you remember? No. <laughs> You've <laughs> only got one to remember. See, well, you're I'm off lucky. the hook. I remember my own phone number, so. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. So uh, let's pack up and, and go check out a manhole cover. All right. Thanks, everybody. So here we are standing, Dover, New Hampshire, on, do you know what street this is? This is Union Street. Union, Union street. street. Oh, 28 Union Street, actually. Uh, you've just watched the episode of us sitting down talking about this manhole cover, uh, which I've, you've already seen because I put it in, but uh, I wanted to, standing at this, you know, historic, monumentous uh, manhole cover, thank Bill for having us down and, and showing us around, driving us around. Uh, it was really cool to be here, see the historical marker, and just kind of take part and see the, the really cool thing. You know, it, it's pretty how, cool. How often do you see a custom commemorative manhole cover? I mean, people have commemorative plates, I commemorative it, coins. Yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of another commemorative manhole cover. Go Dover. Good job. Awesome. All right. Until next time. Train hard. Smile. Uh, I forget. Have a great day. Have a great day. It's it's tough when you're on spot like that.